Money problems impact everybody. Money pressure impacts everyone. Money challenges impact every generation. Every generation is feeling stress about money. Did a little research this week. Boomers, Gen Xers, but mostly millennials. Listen to this. 70% of millennials report being stressed out about money. 63% report being constantly worried about money. The two leading causes of stress when it comes to money is debt, being overwhelmed with debt, and the state of the, the economy. I want you to think about this. This is a pretty sad statistic, um, and I don't mean this in a pun sort of way, but 37%, uh, only 37% of millennials report being happy. And they attribute their unhappiness to money and to financial stress and to financial pressure. In fact, a growing number are experiencing what they call financial fatalism, where they feel no hope, no matter how hard they work, they never feel like they can get ahead. And as a result, they isolate themselves. This is true. This is all online. You can find it yourself. As a result, they're isolating themselves. They're detaching emotionally and they're turning even to substance to try to cope with these feelings of hopelessness. Money pressure impacts everyone. Money pressure impacts everyone, but we don't talk about it much. Like I grew up in a home. My mom was a CPA, God rest her soul. My dad a, a P, had a PhD, was a professor at LSU. Go Tigers. I don't know, man. I don't know. After seeing that game yesterday, I don't know. Let me just say, it's torturous to be a LSU Tigers fan. It's just, it's torture season after season. Where was I? Before I was so rudely interrupted by an LSU fan. Um, so my dad was a professor, my mom was CPA, professional people. We never talked about money at home. And my parents struggled with money, even though they were professionals. We lived paycheck to paycheck. Money was always a burden and was always a struggle. I didn't know anything about money. When I graduated high school, you don't talk about money in school. And so money pressure impacts everyone, but no one likes to talk about it. Money pressure impacts everyone, but no one likes to talk about it, especially in church. And I'll be honest, the first time I heard a message or an understand talk, of, uh, illustration, teaching about money was in church. When I got planted in the house of God, that's when I got my mind right about money and I began to understand money. Thankfully, as a young man, it wasn't, I wasn't too far gone. I was in debt and wasn't being wise with my finances, but I had a reset because of the word of God. Well, we don't like to talk about we don't like to talk about money in church. However, however, listen to me, everybody. Jesus talked about money all the time. Yes, he did. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about prayer. 50% of the parables of Jesus deal with money. Yes, it is true. If I talked about money as much as Jesus, I would get canceled. We'd have about 50 people here. <laughs> uh, why did Jesus talk about money so much? Because he is after your heart. And money and your heart, they're interrelated. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Hope you brought your Bible to church today. Grab your Bible off the nightstand if you're still laying, in laying up in bed. <laughs> Put your coffee down. Grab that. Genesis, I said Genesis, Matthew, Matthew chapter six, uh, Leslie said this morning, she said, boy, it would be a good day to sleep in and watch online. I said, babe, we got to go. We got we to we go lead this thing. <laughs> she didn't say it exactly like that, but it was sort of like <laughs> Matthew chapter six. Are you ready? Words in red. Everybody say words in red. And if, and if you look at this passage, it is within Jesus' longest message, the Sermon on the Mount. So he's going to deal with all kinds of things here. And he's going to land on money. Do not 
do not, everybody say, do not, do not not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin, everybody say vermin. Vermin. First time you ever said that word right there, vermin, (laughs) where vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But here's the solution, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Here we go right here for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. See, the truth is, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Our bank statement is a theological document. Our bank statement is a theological document that reveals who we truly love and who our true master is, who our true Lord is, who we are really worshiping. Billy Graham said, tell me what you think about money and I will tell you what you think about God. For these two are closely related. A man's heart is closer to his wallet than anything else. Wow. Jesus concludes this little section on finances in verse 24. He says, no one can serve. This is really the crux of the matter right here. This is the issue. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Does everybody see it? You cannot serve both God and money. So there are over 2000 verses in the Bible about money. I read all of them. I studied all of them and they break down into three big themes that I would like to give you right now. This is the summary of what God's word says about money. Three big themes, and we're gonna go deeper with one today. Sound good, everybody? So the first, the first big theme, and, and by the way, all of, them, all of them require something from you, and all of them bring a result from God. So all of them require something from you that initiates a, a a result from God. You do know that a theme in scripture is uh, draw near to God and he draws near to you. So you think about that, that process. It doesn't say God draws near to you, then you draw near to him. The, the Bible teaches that when we draw near to him, he responds. So, so these, these themes, these buckets represent the, you know, that, that principle. So here's, here's the first theme. It's the theme of honor. Everybody say honor. Honor honor financially means worshiping God with the first part of your income. Worshiping God with the first part of your income. Honor means to respect. It means to admire. It means um, show deference to when you honor And when you honor the Lord financially, you're going to worship him with the first part of your income. And the result, this is God's part. This is God's part. When you worship God with the first part, the result will be from the Lord, supernatural provision and God's favor. That's the result. That's what God brings. When I, when I step toward the Lord financially and I'm going to honor him with that first part, what's he going to do? The result is there's going to be provision that comes from God supernatural, which means it goes beyond my natural ability and favor God's favor. All right, everybody got it. Let's go to the second one. The second one is interesting. It's, it's, it's probably marked by this word more than any other word, discipline, discipline. So there's honor, then there's discipline and discipline is managing. It's managing your money with excellence. A lot of verses in the Bible about managing what God has provided and to do it with excellence. And the result, I think this is amazing right here. The result from the Lord is a supernatural peace and also surplus because when you start managing with discipline and managing with excellence, 
what the Lord has provided, you start feeling a sense of peace and then you have surplus, you have margin. You get to an overflow place in your life. Somebody say overflow. Okay, so, so there's honor and then there's discipline. And then the third one is generosity. So again, I would say all of the verses in the Bible break down into these, these sort of three themes. You, you, you think, well, generosity sort of covers everything, but it's a little different. Think about it this way. Generosity is strategic giving that moves God's kingdom forward. So it's beyond the, the element of honoring God with the first part. That's your personal worship. When you honor God with the first part of you, that's your personal, that's your, really that's your personal obligation to the Lord. You're honoring him, you're thanking him for what he has provided. Generosity is when you're committed to this overflow sort of mentality and it's strategic giving that moves God's kingdom forward. So the kingdom of God becomes a, a real, um, noticeable thing to you, to, to, to people that are living at this level, you you notice the kingdom of God and, and you, 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 you value the impact that the kingdom of God has on this earth. Like you, you realize, wow, the kingdom of God, the church and, and all of the things that, that are flowing out of the church, all of the ministries and the outreaches and the things that are happening around the world are making a difference. And we need them to make a difference in this dark world that we're living in. That, that's when you're living at another level. It's that generosity level. What's the result? The result is you feel this supernatural sense of purpose. And there's a sense of faith adventure that comes along with it because you are a part of your partners with the Lord in moving his kingdom forward. So honor, discipline, generosity, honor, discipline, generosity. Obviously this is a two part series. So I'm going to hit one this weekend and I'm going to hit one next weekend. So obviously we can only touch two of these. And so I'm going to start with what I feel is the, the first in, in, in terms of order, which is the first one I gave you, which is honor, honoring God, worshiping God with the first part of your income. Now, um, um, I, I think when you, when you look at the verses where Jesus taught on money, 90% of them fall in this category. Jesus spent very little time talking about discipline. He did spend some time talking about generosity and the, and the, the impact of our finances moving the kingdom of, of God forward. But he primarily focused on this sense of where's your heart? Where's your heart? because Jesus was a, he was a heart guy. He wanted to reach people's heart. He came into a time when the religious system was so full of rules and regulations, it was extremely difficult and pretty impossible to even feel like you were pleasing God. So Jesus came along and he broke all of that down and he said, no, 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 just work with me. Come to me because my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, walk with me and you'll feel grace and you'll please the father. Because if, if you've seen me, you've seen the father and he just went after our heart. Amazing. And what's interesting is, um, he went into this, this intersection of, 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 of money and the heart. He just went right at it because Jesus knows, knew then knows now that money it can cloud and complicate and impact our heart in such a big way. So this is why he's spending nine out of 10 of the verses where Jesus talked about money. He's, he's down into the details of this theme of, of, I want your heart. I want you to serve me. I want you to honor me. And he's just going at it. He's like, you can't, this is Jesus. You can't worship God and worship money. Can't do it. It's not like, well, maybe, and for the most part, and if you're mature, you can't. Impossible to serve God and serve money. And most of us are like, well, I'm not serving money. And it's interesting because if you look at different translations of the passage that I just read, for example, the New King James Version 
says, this is how Jesus said it, you can't serve God and mammon. Anybody ever heard that word? Mammon. If you grew up King James, you know mammon. You don't know what mammon is, but you know mammon, <laughs> right? Rhymes with famine. <laughs> but you don't know what it means. Mammon is actually a demonic spirit. It's a demonic spirit. If you study it, you'll realize what Jesus was touching is he was touching the spirit behind money, which is mammon, which is greed, and this insatiable desire for more. Money itself is amoral, but there's a spirit that gets behind it that is immoral. It's called mammon, and Jesus said, you, you can't worship mammon. The desire for more, the hunger for more, the drive to accumulate more. You can't, you can't worship that and, and, and me. So you, you, you need to go ahead and choose. That's basically what he was saying. He was going, he was going after our, our heart. So how do I worship God with my money? I'm going to give you something very simple today. Very simple thought. It won't be that much longer. And then we're going to have a little worship at the end. And we're going to sing, bless God when it's nice and sunny. <laughs> we're changing the words. Bless God when it's dark and rainy. We'll worship a little bit at the end and we'll be on our way today. Plenty of time. Don't need to leave early. Don't need to worry about lunch plans. You will be good. Very simple thought. How do I worship God with my money? Can I just give you one simple tool? One simple principle, tithing. Let me unpack it. And I love to teach on this. I, I actually get excited about teaching on this because I do think about the John Sieblings that are out there. As a young man, when I heard about financial management and honoring God, game changer. I mean, I've probably been tithing for maybe 40 years. Leslie and I, since we've been married, game changer for me in terms of my perspective, my mind, my heart, honoring the Lord. What is tithing? Very simple. Tithing is bringing the first 10% of my income, somebody say my income, to God, right, through my local church. So you read in scripture that the tithe belongs to the Lord and the vehicle that receives it is the church where you are planted because God loves the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. So it is bringing the first 10%, not, you know, not anything else but bringing. Bringing means you, 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 you bring it where you're planted. It's the first 10% of my income to God through my local church. Now, this is significant. This is important, impactful, powerful. A lot of people have never really heard a real clear teaching on tithing. They've just been told this is what you need to do to please God. So if you just stop and think about it, um, your income has to do basically with your life. I mean, you get paid once a month, every two weeks, whenever you close a deal, whatever it is for you. And that income coming to you is a, a product of your life. You've worked, you've given time. It's important. You need it. That's why it's so powerful and so significant. And so, so maybe even hard to understand. I've been praying for you the last few days. And even this morning that you just have faith as I teach about this and and not try to logically figure it out or, or, or not try to, you know, sort of kind of like refute everything I say, but just keep your heart open. I've been praying that you'd have the, just the faith in your heart because this is a game changer. It's just worshiping God and honoring God. And so um, you put him first. This is how, this is how you would know if you looked at my finances that God has first place because he gets the first part. It goes to him. And it belongs to him. Scripture teaches that as a Christian, when I become a Christian, I like to joke about this. It's an old joke, but I appreciate the laughter in just a few minutes. That um, 
when you, are, when you become a Christian, your whole life becomes Christian. You're, you're redeemed. Every part of your life, you know, and when you're baptized, you go underneath the water and you don't hold your wallet out. You don't hold your wallet out. You don't though, really. The reality is you, you get immersed in the things of God. And here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing. It's not about giving, 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 giving. And I know some of you have been a part of ministries, churches, and yes, of course, there've been abuses. But scripture doesn't teach us that it's all about giving, 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 giving. It's really about reordering your priorities so that he has first place in your life, right? Now, so, so, so what does it look like? All right, I've got some Reese's pieces um, that I really, I, I really enjoy. This is one of my favorite candies. And um, it's got peanut butter, so that means protein. That means there is some, <laughs> some nutritional strength. And, and look, if, if, you're, you know, if you're watching a movie, in fact, the back of it says best movie night ever right here on the back. Just, if, if you're on a road trip, really for any occasion, <laughs> Reese's Pieces. And you know what? I think like this bag sort of represents the supply that God brings into your life. Abundance. In fact, anytime I stop on a road trip and they only have this size, I'm like, oh darn. I guess this is what I'm going to have to. But you think about the abundance. The Bible says God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Isn't that amazing? He has all the supply. The Bible says, we sang about it this morning, that every good and perfect gift, he's, he's the one that's brought it into your life. He is the God who supplies. You have a job because of the Lord. You have a car in that parking lot because of the Lord. We all believe that. And I know some of you are like, yeah, but I worked hard for it. But God gave you the energy to work for it. But I went to school and I earned a degree. God gave you the opportunity to go to school and earn that degree. Come on. The supply. Look, the supply is abundant. So I just took a hundred out of a bag and I put it in this, this glass because maybe this glass represents your, your paycheck. God has the abundance. And so he provides you with a paycheck for your hard owned work. So this is a hundred Reese's pieces. So all the Lord says is give, give me 10. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wow. This is what you get to keep. And this is what the Lord asked for. Everybody see it? And remember, as you honor him, with just this, I mean, I could just down these right now. Like, I, <laughs> this is like, this is like one bite for me, right? I mean, this is nothing, but as you honor him with that part, what does he do? He he's backing you up yeah. with his supply, <laughs> with his supply. Those will be consumed this afternoon as I watch football. Uh, two verses you need to see, all right? Because tithing spans every area, every era of God's partnership and relationship with mankind. Tithing starts all the way in Genesis, everybody. 430 years before the law of Moses was given. It's threaded throughout the Old Testament, through the law of Moses, all the way into the New Testament. Hello. It is a New Testament principle. Jesus talked about tithing. 
Want to see? Matthew 23, 23, he's rebuking. He's actually rebuking the religious leaders. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to, help me out with that word. You're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. It's almost like Jesus is saying, this is so elementary. This is so basic. So this is very important that you see this. This is Jesus. You should tithe. Yes. See, some people ignorantly say Jesus never talked about tithing. Right here. You should tithe. Yes. But do not neglect It's almost like, can we move on? Go ahead and tithe and let, let's move on to some bigger issues. One more verse. Let me show you. Malachi 10, uh, three verse 10. Some people say Malachi. It's actually Malachi. (laughs) Just so I want you to know when you run into Malachi in heaven, bring all the tithes. That's actually probably not right. If there was a Hebrew scholar, he would probably give me a better bring Okay, just want to make sure we see that word. Bring all the tithes, where? Into the storehouse so that there may be enough food in my temple. So he's talking about the house of God. If you do, this is very important. Says the Lord of the heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for for you. It's for you, for you. Ten. God says, I'm going to open the windows of heaven over your life for 10 Reese's pieces <laughs> for 10. I'm going to throw open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great. You won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. I love that verse. I have tested the Lord for 40 years and found him good and faithful and willing to bless my life. Oh yes. All right. So I'm going to close with some practical steps. Here we go. You ready? Take some notes. Three very simple steps to take. Number one, tithe now. I'm calling out the now (laughs) because it's so easy for us to say, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to work on my budget. And maybe January, January 1st, pastor, that'd be a great time. Uh -uh. That's three months from now. That's like Pharaoh. When Moses said, when do you want to get rid of the frogs? He said, tomorrow, one more night with the frogs and another season of struggling another season of wondering another season of a lack of peace, another season of not testing God, another season of not trying God's not now. The Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. Today is the day of salvation. So it's so let's tithe. Now one of my, one of my favorite faith verses in the Bible, Hebrews 11 verse one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things unseen. You know that verse now faith is everybody say now faith is. The word now I used to think was, was like a, a, a breather word. Okay. Like, like we finished with chapter 10. Now let's talk about faith. But when you study it in the original Greek, it's called now faith. It's, 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 it's now faith. It's you're not promised tomorrow. Yesterday is gone today. So, so, so faith today, you know what I, you know what I sense there's faith today. Some of you you're receiving this by faith. Some, your life is going to change. Some of you, your life is going to change today because you're getting this message and you, you, you got now faith, now faith. Everybody say now, now. number two, tithe first. This is very practical. This is the most practical piece that I can give you. Wake up in the morning and when the funds are there because you closed the deal, because you got your paycheck, because the check cleared and it's in your account in that moment, 
before you do anything else. All right. Now I know this sounds a little legalistic, but it's, it's, it's actually discipline and commitment before you do anything else, either write a check for that 10% to your church or get online and transfer it online. Let me tell you what, when I see it in my account, I'm thankful for it, but I want that 10% out of my account because it does not belong to me. And w- listen to me, listen, listen to me. If you keep reading Malachi, the Lord talks about robbing him. He talks about taking from him. You know what that means? You're taking what belongs to the Lord. That first 10% got, it has God's name on it. So I, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. I want it out of my account. As soon as it gets out of my account, I feel a sense of faith. I feel a sense of excitement. I feel a sense of like I've honored the Lord. Now it seems very transactional. I know because it's like, well, it doesn't seem like worship to me, but so much of what we do in our practical life as believers is, is worship. It doesn't mean we're standing with our hands lifted and there's worship. There's music playing in the background. If you want to do that every time you get paid, do it. Why not? But worship is a commitment. It's an act of dedication. So tithe now, tithe first, do it, honor him first, then pay your bills, then save some money. See what happens is sometimes we've, we've, we've tried to honor God last. So so here's how we've done it. Sometimes we're like, I'm going to try this. And so we get paid. We save a little money and we pay off some credit card. We do this, pay the bills and all that. Then there's nothing left. So we don't have anything. We worship the Lord with a dollar. Not that a dollar's, not that there's anything wrong with that amount, but it's your, it's not 10%. It's a leftover for you. So that's why you have to flip it and you have to honor him first. And then you, you know what? Then he'll breathe on the remaining amount and it'll multiply. Woo. All right. And then number three, I'm finished right here. Tithe faithfully. Tithe faithfully. Now, I got to just address the elephant in the room. That's those of you that used to tithe and you stopped tithing because life happens. Just come back and begin to honor. You don't have to pay back everything. You know, I know some people think that or preach that. If that's what you feel you're supposed to do, do it. But my advice to you is just start again today. And what happens to some of us is we try something for a little bit and we say, ah, that didn't work. It's not gonna work if you try it for a little bit. You're gonna build a habit. That habit that you form is gonna begin to form your life. And that habit then will give you the strength you need to move through every season of your life. So I'm talking about consistency. I, I, I honestly believe if you started tithing today, you'd see a difference dramatically. But then three months from now, you'll start to see some stability. You'll start to see some things flowing into your, in fact, here we are, you know, at the mid September, end September, by the time you get to Christmas, life can look different for you because you've made a decision to not just tithe now, but to tithe first and to tithe faithfully in Jesus name. Let's put that. Let's put that statement back up one one more time. All right. Can we stand to our feet? Everybody, is that cool? Can we stand to our feet without grabbing our stuff and leaving? Okay, good. Thanks. Some, some people that's a cue. You get the kids. I'll start the car. We're good. We're good on time. Um, please remember this right here. Please remember. We're honoring God. We're honoring him. It's a, this is about the Lord, less about you and more about him. You're worshiping him with the first part of your income and the result, supernatural provision and God's favor. Does that sound good to anybody beside me? Supernatural provision and God's favor. Can I pray for you? I'm going to pray for you. Can we lift our hands all together? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for the, this word to settle into the hearts of those that need to hear it and act upon it 
And I pray as our hands are lifted, as we honor you, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father God, for faith. Your word says, as the Lord is lifted and as the word is preached, faith will rise. Thank you for faith rising in the hearts of your people today. Thank you, Father God, for that promise of supernatural provision, of open heaven, windows open over our life and our family and over our finances. Thank you for the, 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 the promise of abundance and overflow provision. Supernatural, Lord, we've done the natural. Now we need your super on our natural. And Lord, I just pray, renew our minds today. Set, set things right in our hearts and in our minds. Thank you for the, for the people that will be here that have never heard this before, that realize this is the key for my future. Thank you, Father God, for, for people stepping forward in faith. Thank you, Lord, that this will be a day, Lord, that will live in infamy. We'll, we'll look back and say, that was the day when I made a decision that would change and alter the course of my life. Thank you for that today. Thank you for a flow in our lives in the name of Jesus. And I pray across this whole congregation, those that are watching online, those at every one of our locations, I thank you, Father God, for your peace, your abundance. Father God, open doors. Thank you, Lord, for a new level. Everybody say a new level. A new level in Jesus' name. Come on, can we thank you for that? Can we thank you for that? All right, all right, one more thing. One more thing, heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm gonna pray for anybody here and you need Jesus in your life. You need forgiveness. You need to make a decision to be a Christian. I'm not talking about money right now. I'm talking about your soul. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about where your name is written. The Bible says God writes our name in heaven when we ask him to forgive us of our sin. This is salvation. This is powerful. The most important moment of the service right here as people get ready to step across a line of faith. I've been praying for you today. Some of you need to turn away from some things that are going on in your life and you need to turn to Jesus. I specifically feel, I felt burdened about this this morning that there are some uh, husbands and wives or some marriages here today that you are struggling supremely and you would maybe even think you're on the brink of divorce. And I'm gonna tell you today that God has a plan for your marriage. Don't give up on your wife, don't give up on your husband and collectively turn toward the Lord and watch how the Lord will heal and begin to restore. And I know you may be here and your spouse is not here, I get that. But you do what you can do. Turn to the Lord. Jesus uses the word repent, which means to turn away from sin. And that's what you need to do. You need to turn to the Lord today. I'm not talking to those of you that you've been a Christian and, and, and you've maybe stumbled and you know you went to a club last night and you made some mistakes. I'm not talking to you, you're a Christian, you're a believer. I'm talking to those of you who have not been following Jesus with your life and you need to turn to the Lord today. This is heaven and hell. This is heaven and hell. Some of you have never done this before. Others of you, you've, you, you used to serve the Lord a long time ago, but you're, you're running from God today. This is what the Lord told me to tell you. Stop running and away from the Lord and start, start running toward the Lord and he will meet you right where you are and do some amazing, incredible things in your life. Before we pray, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm not gonna call you down front, nothing wrong with that, but I'm just gonna ask you in just a second, if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to lift up a hand and then we're gonna pray all together. Everybody's gonna raise their voice together. I'm gonna pray this prayer, then we're gonna go into some beautiful worship. About 60 seconds of dynamic, powerful worship and we'll be on our way today. If that's you, I don't want you to get in your car and regret this moment, okay? This may be an uncomfortable moment for you, but you need to surrender. You're not gonna add Jesus onto all your other stuff. You're turning away from your stuff and you're turning to Jesus. That's what this moment is all about. Right where you're standing, if this is you, I've been praying for you today. I've been praying that you'd have the courage to say yes to the Lord. It's the beginning of a new life. If that's you, right where you're standing, I want you to boldly lift a hand right now, lift it up. Lift it up big. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. So I want you to do this with boldness. I mean, all the way. You're going all the way with Jesus. So many hands going up. I'm going to wait a second more because you, there's others of you. You're, you're, you're struggling in this decision. Don't struggle. Don't fight this. Come on. You've done so much stuff. The least you can do is lift a hand and give your heart to Jesus. You're fighting. it. Don't fight it. You don't need to fight this. This is the Lord, the love of the Lord. Oh, so good. So many hands. Unbelievable. Thank you. 
Thank you for being obedient to the Lord, for saying yes to the Lord. Now, we're going to pray. The team's going to lead us in that beautiful song. We're going to sing just for a moment be on our way today. We've got plenty of time. We're not rushing off. Let's all lift our hands all together. And let's pray this prayer all out loud together. Even if you're not turning to the Lord for the first time or as an act of rededication, you're doing it um, um, uh, to support those who are. All right? So everybody say this with me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your plan for my life. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for leaving the comfort of heaven and coming to the chaos of this earth. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross, giving your life for me. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection. Father God, in Jesus' name, I turn towards you. I repent of my sin. And I ask you, forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me. Make me do. Come live inside of me and give me the strength to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, come on, let's celebrate. Come on. Come on, let's worship. Let's God in the fields of plenty. Yeah. Let's God in the darkest valley. Every chance I get. Come on, let's give them our best worship.